Hello, class. <clears throat> Hope this is going to be helpful. It'll be helpful to some of you. That I'm um, going to do a review lecture <clears throat> for the final, for the last three chapters. And so all the information is in the lectures. That's all there in the chapter. <clears throat> and Monday, the exam will be 50 questions. And all the questions is going to be online. So they come from the textbook. And I went through all of them to make sure I had talked about all of them. Um, so that they're appropriate questions. And it will choose questions from the from the three different areas. So that's what it's going to be turned about in terms of pre preparation. I mean, I look at my lectures, look at the, your notes, look at the uh, um, learn smarts, uh, the PowerPoints, you know, the, the questions will be things I've talked about. <clears throat> that's you know, the major points of the chapters. Now, um, I'll start off uh, talk about uh, sexual reproduction. <clears throat> so first of all, that chapter is a little hairy in parts, but as I said, I'm not going to ask you the details of meiosis. You need to know that we take uh, diploid cells <clears throat> and we make haploid gametes, the sperm in males and the eggs in females or ovum. All right, so you know that. Um, and then, of course, you know, I talked about the lecture, the just the big difference to males and Females, I mean, we all start out the same. And then with the Y, y chromosome, <clears throat> you start producing uh, androgens, testosterone and such. And uh, males and females diverge. So external genitalia, whether we make testes or ovaries, you know, it's gonna diverge in uh, two different directions. And of course, I talked about why sex at all. <clears throat> it's a dangerous, it's uh, wasteful. Males are, are pretty much useless in making babies. Um, so, uh, the point is that um, without sexual reproduction, we're all clones and we can't evolve, we can't change the environment and we're doomed to extinction as a species. <clears throat> we believe in theory anyway, that's what sex is for, to mix up the genes so we can change and evolve over time. Now, of course, males and females are, have a big, have different strategies in the evolutionary world too. In evolution, you wanna leave as many babies as possible. You're, leave as many of your genes to the next generation to be completely accurate. So, um, and of course, males, they produce sperm from puberty through the rest of their life, daily, hundreds of millions of sperm, all right? Um, females, the eggs are, go through meiosis even uh, when you're in, in uterus, in utero. And then um, as you, you approach uh, puberty, you end up with hundreds of thousands of these primordial follicles. And uh, they, they're all uh, kind of frozen. They went through meiosis and kind of stopped. And then from um, puberty or menarche until menopause, when you're in your late 40s, 50s, early 50s, women will ovulate monthly. And um, that means we're talking about 400, 500 ova, you know, potentially in a lifetime, as opposed to hundreds of millions of sperm in each ejaculate every day, right? So strategy... Also, it involves the, the, the woman not only produces the sex cells, but has to have an environment to hold the fetus in nine months. And then after that, the mammary glands and apparatus to care for that uh, offspring for years, right? Some of you guys, decades are still being taken care of by your parents. Um, so when you look at strategies, uh, uh, females can uh, usually pick here because there's much more of an investment. <clears throat> the male can lead the sperm and never come back and his genes will go on. Well, of course, you know, husbands and spouses, partners help, you know, raising. And so that will, will help their genes if they've contributed genes, um, but it's not necessary. And so, you know, there's different uh, strategies for the sexes, but overall of all the systems your body went through, reproductive system is one you can live without, but the species can't continue without. So it's kind of a, a unique system. <clears throat> All right, so going through uh, some things, again, I'm just, I, hopefully this is something you would listen to, you've already studied, and now, you know, it's the weekend before, the test is Monday, and you're kind of listening, kind of putting things big picture together, and maybe catching some things that you should uh, um, fill in your studies with. Uh, so looking at, looking at the reproductive chapter, <clears throat> of course, the anatomy, <clears throat> male and female anatomy, external and internal anatomy. 
So we talk about, um, we talk about, I talked about, you listened hopefully, about the testes um, developing high up and the ovaries. And the ovaries descend into the pelvis, but the testes keep going and they go through, they bust a hole in your peritoneal cavity, go out to rest in the scrotum. And because of that, males will more often get hernias, these inguinal hernias, because there's a weakness where that testes had to come through. And remember what it's called if you have undescended testes, it's crypt orchism, so hidden orchids or testes. And so they need to get those out. And the whole purpose of having the testes out in the scrotum is for some reason, spermatogenesis needs to take place a couple degrees cooler than um, our body temperature. So look at all the terms, the gubernaculum is a little uh, ligament that kind of guides it and holds the testes to the bottom of the scrotum. You have spermatic cord with blood vessels and your vas deferens going through it and the cremaster muscle that can raise and lower the testes, right? And the penis, no, it has the corpora, uh, cavernosum, two of them on top, and then spongiosum below. And those are erectile tissue, you know, basically that uh, the arteries relax and the veins get compressed and it causes erection in male and female. And the clitoris, same thing. It has a, the glands is the end and it has a erectile tissue, right? And then, uh, you know, the pathway of sperm, you know, they're produced, first of all, uh, in the seminiferous tubules in the testes, these long tubes. And the tube is going to have along the outside cells, these spermatogonium, these uh, stem cells that are always dividing, and they go towards the inner part, they develop into sperm. So one of those go through meiosis and make four sperm. They turn into spermatids, and then finally sperm or spermatozoa. And they got a tail and a head region, right? And they have the haploid uh, DNA in it. And um, these sperm will move through the seminiferous tubule. And along with those <clears throat> cells making the sperm are these sustentacular cells that are helpers, that nourish them, that remove the waste, and they're just part of the picture. And also just to, to be clear too, outside the seminiferous tubules, there are interstitial cells out there that make testosterone, all right? So the, <clears throat> the sperm will go through the uh, seminiferous tubule, this thing called the reedes testi, into the epididymis. Epididymis is a long tube that's glommed on the side of the testes. <clears throat> and the sperm will mature there. And even though they have a tail, they don't actually swim at this point. They, they don't really swim in, usually until uh, they're introduced to the other seminal fluids. And so at the very end, but they're ready. They, they mature, they wait at the epididymis, <clears throat> see if they're going to be called up to duty. And if they're not, they get recycled, destroyed, and you keep making new every day. But the two vas deferens or ductus deferens come up from the testes, <clears throat> they go behind the bladder, and then they'll meet behind the bladder and uh, they'll go into the prostate gland. And so the two vas deferens come into it and they're met by two big glands, semin semin uh, seminal vesicles, that make like 60% of the fluid. And then the prostate gland is solid and it makes most of the rest of the fluid. And then, um, through the prostate is your urethra taking urine from the bladder. And then the two uh, vas deferens come in and make an ejaculatory duct, just a little connection there. It's like a little Y. And that's where <clears throat> the male reproductive system, the urethra is used for urine and reproduction. And the female, the urethra is just for urine. Another, you know, those are all important things to know. And then the sperm, <clears throat> the sperm come from the testes, the adult the testes, and semen is the fluid. And that most of the fluid comes from the seminal vesicles and the prostate gland. And then you have little bubble urethral glands that make mostly mucus that also empty into the urethra. And uh, the urethra is much longer in the male than the female. And so less bladder infections in males and females too. All right, looking good. And uh, the production of sperm, um, if you look at the testes of the adolescence, <clears throat> there's no sperm being produced, but your pituitary eventually will mature and start producing FSH and LH, which will get the testes <clears throat> developing at puberty. And the testes, those interstitial cells producing uh, testosterone. And testosterone in, in a male is going to make, um, well, in both actually, it's going to make uh, muscle growth, bone density, hair appearing, your, your voice deepening because the larynx cartilages get bigger. Um, yeah. And uh, in the woman development, um, it's going to be estrogens. That's going to make the, the breast develop and fat de depositions more in the buttocks and the, and the, and the thighs. Um, Yes, and so the influence of the two hormones, and we talk about your primary sex organs are the testes and the ovaries. They're making 
the hormones and making the uh, gametes. Uh, but secondary sexual characteristics would be the penis and the breasts, other, other things. So <clears throat> you can put all the reproductive organs really into two categories. The important ones are the ovaries and testes. This is where you make you know, the sperm and the eggs. All right, uh, let's take a look. And then uh, uh, at the end, talked about uh, what a vasectomy is and or tubal ligation, ways of um, preventing eggs or sperm from traveling from the ovary or testes. All right, looking good, let's see. And then looking at the female reproductive system, and again, I'm not gonna teach it again, but realize you, know, you have the ov two ovaries uh, and then you have a uterus. And the uterus has a fundus on top, the body is the main part of it, and the cervix is a round part, the neck part that goes into the vagina. So uh, without a, a, a uterus, the vagina is just a dead end sac. But with a uterus, the cervix comes in, there's a little tiny hole in it. And that little canal uh, normally is filled with mucus, thick mucus, and it protects things from getting in, infecting your uterus. But uh, during ovulation time, it gets more watery. So monthly cycles due to hormones make the cervix change from being kind of thick with mucus and then watery, more able for sperm to come in. And um, <clears throat> the ovaries really are a control of the hormones. Uh, I mean, your pituitary is also FSH, follicle stimulating hormones, it's gonna make your ovaries have follicles mature. So of those thousands and thousands of primordial follicles, a handful, a dozen start developing. And there, there's always some developing, it's, it's a constant cycle. <clears throat> and then as you get closer to ovulation, uh, usually one takes over and it's really big. It could be two, but it's usually one big one and uh, the rest stay small. And um, if you look at the, the, the menstrual cycle, you know, you have uh, uh, after um, a menstruation, the bleeding, and then you have uh, a buildup of the endometrium, the inner lining of the uterus. And then you, at the, concurrently, you have uh, an egg maturing in a follicle. So the egg isn't by naked by itself. It has cells around it. We call it the follicle that surround it. And as the egg matures, you get this secondary, this big, you know, mature follicle, there's a, a bunch of fluid accumulates in it. So the egg is sit there on this little cloud with this bunch of fluid and these follicle cells around it. And the follicle cells are making hormones. And then I could ask you what causes ovulation, what hormone, LH. So LH uh, spikes and then you have ovulation, the egg is released into the cavity. And hopefully it's picked up by the little fimbriae and cilia on the ovarian to uh, uterine tubes or fallopian tubes. And uh, the egg will, will, will make its way in there. And then what happened to that follicle after it burst? Well, those cells become the corpus luteum, the yellow body. And they will produce hormones, progesterone mostly, that will tell the uterus, stay ready, stay ready, stay ready. And now if you don't get pregnant, then, then this corpus, uh, um, Luteum eventually breaks down into the yellow body, corpus albicans, and does nothing, just scar tissue. And if there's all of a sudden there's no more hormones, your endometrium dies. And you have, remember, you have the endometrium is this bloody inner layer. You have a basal layer that always stays there, and then a functional layer that is sloughed off every month. And so the, the arteries are spiral and all these glands. It prepares for a pregnancy. But every month, if there's not, that outer functional layer just goes. And so every month ovulation going on like that. Now the egg, if it is, um, uh, there's sperm to be had. And of course the male, you know, you guys know how sex works, but uh, the sperm uh, is in the vagina. And uh, then by then the, the, the semen, actually the fluid has uh, chemicals to neutralize the acidity of the vagina. So the vagina stratified squamous, remember there's no glands in it, only at the cervix and at the opening, but it makes uh, sugars that feed bacteria that make an acidic environment in your vagina. So the semen is going to neutralize that. So the sperm are happy and it has a bunch of uh, nutrients too, because the sperm don't, can't store much energy. So they use that energy as they, they swim, but they can't swim that far. They're microscopic, right? So <clears throat> the semen hopefully is up close to the, uh, where the cervix is and, um, yeah, if the cervix is open and watery, it's during the period of ovulation when you can get pregnant, the sperm will enter the uterus, through the uterus up the, the tubes and fertilization takes place early in that tube as the egg slowly moves through the uh, uterine tube. And then fertilization will take place and then it'll turn to 
two cells, four cells, 16 cells, it'll turn to a ball of cells, reaches the uterus, it may implant, form a placenta. Then it says, ovaries, we got a pregnancy. And so that corpus albicans won't deteriorate, it will stay and will keep that lining. And it goes on for nine months. All right, big discussion of, uh, of sex here. What else? Um, female reproductive, external anatomy, could ask about the, the labia, clitoris, uh, vaginal opening, mons pubis, look at all that. Um, mammary glands, give me a question on those. <clears throat> Just realize that they, they have monthly changes. They changed depending on uh, hormones and especially during pregnancy. And uh, that's where <clears throat> late in pregnancy and prolactin is what caused them to make milk. And that's actually being inhibited, inhibited. And then all of a sudden uh, after birth, that inhibition is gone and they start producing milk. And remember oxytocin is gonna squeeze it out. And as long as you have that feedback of <clears throat> breastfeeding, you'll have uh, be producing milk. And if you stop, then you stop producing. Your breasts go back to normal. And the anatomy, areola, nipple, all that. And then uh, finally talked about uh, birth control and uh, sexually transmitted infections. So could be a couple questions on those, just um, uh, things you all should know about being young adults. Uh, uh, the, the birth control is just stopping pregnancy and there's all different levels to do that, right? From stopping ovulation to a barrier condom or a diaphragm, stopping the sperm from getting to the egg, um, stopping implantation and IUD is going to you could fertilize an egg, but it can't implant uh, to abortion if you, you, it does implant and you wanna stop the pregnancy later. So all these levels, um, right. And uh, vasectomy tubal ligation is the surgical way to do that. And castration is removing the testes and then you don't produce hormones. And uh, yeah, they used to do that uh, early on um, the medieval times. <clears throat> young boys with beautiful voices, they would castrate them and make these eunuchs. And so they would keep that uh, boyish voice throughout their adults, you know, as other effects, of course. Um, one other thing I should mention too, which I didn't mention in the lecture talking, because a lot of you are interested in athletics, is that a lot of elite female athletes um, will have amenorrhea. They won't menstruate and they can't get pregnant um, because your, your body needs a certain amount of body fat. Uh, um, and in evolutionary times, you know, if you had no very little body fat as a woman, you couldn't really be able to carry a child, right? So um, <clears throat> you'll find that in a lot of uh, uh, female athletes with very low body fat, you know, very lean, that um, they won't menstruate and they won't be able to get pregnant. And then uh, STIs, used to be STDs, but STIs, infections, just know bacterial, viral are the main ones and uh, chlamydia is the most common and the viral ones are HIV and herpes and, uh, Antibiotics work against the syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia ones, and so. I think that's good. I think that's good. It's me, you know, giving you the main points, uh, and, uh, and I hope that's helpful. Let's see here. Uh, we can talk. Uh, uh, digestion was the big chapter. <clears throat> so, of the fifty questions that you're going to be given, uh, half of them will be on the digestive chapter, and then a quarter on reproduction and a quarter on uh, nutrition. I thought that was about appropriate for the time I spent in the material. So of course, digestion, you think about big picture, uh, why we need food. It's for uh, the raw materials and for the calories to burn, to cause chemical reactions so we can be alive and have a, a high body temperature. And digestion really is separated into two different parts. There's the physical digestion, you break it down with your teeth and the churning of your stomach. And then the chemical digestion. And these are all your enzymes. <clears throat> and the recent questions on those, I'm sure, is where digestion chemically takes place. And so let's talk about it. Um, when food comes in your mouth, it's going to be hit with saliva. And again, anatomy-wise, know your three salivary glands, parotid, submandibular, sublingual. We talked about the lips, the tongue, cheeks, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, every tooth, like this is going to be my right central incisor maxillary. And this is my left, left um, uh, mandibular canine. And then I only have molar one and two. I don't have molar three. So be able to, to know every tooth for um, 
for practical and for, and for, for lecture. And uh, I know the anatomy of the tooth, the enamel, the dentin, the pulp cavity, uh, exactly. No, we have two sets of teeth. I'm not gonna review it all. Um, but some of the difficult things might be, you know, where, where the enzymes take place. And so saliva has salivary amylase that breaks down starches. So if I ask you, when does digestion begin? It begins in the mouth with saliva. Um, then uh, know that the, the pharynx, know about swallowing that, that process. I definitely ask a question, your tongue moving that bolus, your soft palate closing off your nasal cavity, your larynx rising, the epiglottis closing, the food, the pharyngeal muscles will constrict, move it into the open esophagus. This alimentary canal is this your tube and um, realize uh, it's squamous cells in your esophagus, then it's all columnar. The ends of the anal canal will be squamous again. Um, realize that skeletal muscle will be your tongue and your mouth, even your pharynx and beginning your esophagus, then it's smooth muscle, the rest of the gut. Very important, your gut tube, the layers of it has a mucosa, a submucosa, a muscle layer, and a serosa on the outside. Know that the organs in your abdominal cavity are surrounded by the the visceral peritoneum, the parietal peritoneum align the cavity, and your organs like your, your stomach and your intestines are hung by the back wall by mesenteries, which are that membrane that comes together and carries the blood vessels and such. So much to know. All right. And then we get down into your, uh, <clears throat> your esophagus is simply a tube to, to push it down to your stomach. Know your sphincters. You're going to have upper and lower esophageal sphincter, pyloric sphincter, ileocecal, and then an internal and external anal sphincter, with the external, the one you control. All right, then in your stomach, realize uh, the anatomy of it, the, the fundus, the pyloric region, and then um, realize that uh, the main enzyme is pepsin. And it's actually secreted as pepsinogen, and the acid will turn it into pepsin. And then cells also secrete a lot of mucus to protect your stomach, and then hydrochloric acid. There's also gastric lipase. You break down a little bit of fats, but mainly your stomach breaks down the proteins, hits it with a real acidic environment, which will help kill off some bad pathogens too. Then when it turns in your stomach, the pyloric sphincter is gonna open periodically to squirt out a little bit of chyme, that's that fluid in your stomach. It's gonna squirt out into the duodenum, your small intestine. When it hits your small intestine, it's going to, of course, be acidic, and it's going to stretch it, and it's gonna send out hormones that go back to the stomach. So gastrin is a hormone the stomach makes that makes the stomach get excited. The intestines make a little bit of gastrin, gets a little excited for a little bit, but then it's gonna inhibit it. So once your stomach is emptying, it's like, okay, I think we're done with the digestion. And if it gets super acidic in your stomach, okay, we're done with digestion. And, um, but uh, the small intestine, the cells are gonna release um, uh, secretin, which is gonna make the, uh, the pancreas secrete juices, and then cholecystokinin, CCK, which is gonna make the pancreas secrete juices and the gallbladder secrete, uh, squeeze out the bile. So what this does is it makes the food, the chyme that enters the intestine be squirted with this juice, it comes in a common tube from the gallbladder and the pancreas is gonna squirt it. And the pancreatic juice has enzymes for everything, lipases and, uh, amylase for starches down there. And uh, the important protein busters are trypsin's the main one. And it makes actually, uh, uh, it makes uh, trypsinogen in the pancreas. It's converted to trypsin in the intestine by a chemical that it makes called enterokinase. And so trypsin is dangerous, right? If it was to burst open up in your uh, pancreas, you get pancreatitis, it'll eat away at it. So you make trypsinogen and then it converts it in the intestines that way. And, uh, and then of course the pancreas, one of the big things it does is it makes bicarbonate ions to neutralize the acid from that chyme coming from the stomach. Yeah. <clears throat> the bile that's being squirted, you should know of course that is to emulsify fats. This will allow you to take clumps of fat into small pieces of fat so that lipases can break it down. And know what produces bile? Your liver, the hepatocytes, your liver cells make bile and they, are uh, collected in your gallbladder. And then you have this pancreatohepatic sphincter is closed. The gallbladder between meals will fill up. And then with CCK, it'll squeeze, the sphincter will relax and it'll allow it to be squirted out. <clears throat> so your gallbladder stores and concentrates the, uh, the bile. 
And because it's concentrating this thick liquid, you can have gallstones, which are usually cholesterol. But they can be that greenish pigment comes from red blood cells, Billy, uh, Billy Rubin too. You can have stones made out of that. And in bile, you get rid of cholesterol. Cholesterol, these pigments, but the bile salts are what emulsify the fats. And so that's the important part. All right, <clears throat> your, your, your chyme at that point has reached the small intestine and know why it has such a tremendous surface area, uh, a baseball diamond size. And your uh, small intestine has three parts and that's where absorption takes place. You absorb the nutrients, water, vitamins, all these things come out. So, and the intestine itself makes enzymes. And so the pancreas makes enzymes. So these chemical enzymes allow you to break down all the different kinds of proteins and carbs and fats that you guys ingest. <clears throat> the large intestine, its main function is to reabsorb water and electrolytes. And no, there's a huge floor of a bacteria. And remember, I talked about how important that bacteria is to your health. There's all kinds of new research looking at people's bacteria and their guts and how it affects their mental status and their health. And, um, and at the end, remember, remember the parts of the large intestine, ascending, descending, the appendix, the cecum, and then the sigmoid colon. The rectum is where it straightens out. And defecation is going to the bathroom. Yeah, so. Defecation is a, is a reflex also where um, you control that external sphincter, but the internal sphincter and the, the rectum will distend and it will tell you that you need to avoid this and you can control it. And then when you relax it, you relax this muscle, you straighten out the rectum and then you can defecate. All right, let's take a look. I see intrinsic factor is coming here in here and that is secreted by the stomach, allows you to absorb vitamin B12 in your intestines. And I noticed I talked to maybe a little complex and I talked about your stomach, how it gets ready for food. And you have a cephalic phase, a thinking phase where your mouth waters, the juices start going when you're on the way to lunch. And then, of course, you have a gastric phase when it's in, you hit your stomach, and then you start squirting these juices. Gastrin is an important hormone. And overall, digestion, you guys should know, is it sympathetic or parasympathetic is going to make digestion go? Parasympathetic, the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve, acetylcholine, is going to uh, cause your gastric juices to be secreted, the muscles to uh, start contracting. And so the gastric phase is when during when your stomach is working, then when it hits the intestines, the intestinal phase. And that's when the intestine goes back to the stomach and says, okay, we got some, so slow down. And uh, it's gonna begin uh, the gallbladder and pancreas getting involved, yeah. And your small intestine, the movements, peristalsis moves it down the tube. And then segmentation is gonna be uh, mixing it up. That happens throughout. And remember in your large intestine, the movements are more of these mass movements where there's like a big movement every once in a while instead of this constant kind of movement. All right, beautiful. And then um, changes with life, you mainly uh, your teeth don't tend to last a hundred years, all right? The enamel uh, wears away and such. All right, coffee's getting cold. All right, so again, I, I can't, you know, take hours to review everything, but I'm hitting the main points that, uh, that uh, come to mind. Um, and so now the nutrition chapter, uh, hopefully you enjoyed the, the lectures. Um, I gave them last year, I looked at them like, oh God, this was spot on. So you guys get those. It's a good chapter. And a lot of you guys are, are interested in this kind of thing. You're interested in athletics, nutrition, you're young, you guys work out, you worry about what you eat. <clears throat> Not all of us, but you know, a lot of you do. But the chapter is good. I mean, it talks about a couple things. <clears throat> talk about essential nutrients uh, and, and vitamins and minerals. And then we talk about calories. And then we talk about healthy eating lifestyle. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's the overview of the whole chapter. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, take a look, maybe understand uh, uh, carbs and understand uh, uh, we get those from starches and sugar. It's our main energy source. And, um, and lipids is how we tend to store our, our, our energy. And uh, remember that lipids uh, have twice as much energy as, a, as a, uh, carbs or protein per weight. And so that's really going to um, 
um, make it a good way to, uh, to store your energy, right? Uh, yeah, so we like fatty foods because they're <clears throat> packed, with, uh, packed with the nutrients. Um, lipids, uh, again, remember uh, saturated, unsaturated, what that means. Um, there's no essential carbs that you need. I mean, we use glucose as our main fuel. Uh, there are a couple essential fatty acids that we need to get from our diet. And then we talk proteins, that's where it's really important. Uh, make sure you understand that, what are um, uh, going to be essential amino acids. Of the 20, you know, I think it's eight or so that are, uh, we have to get from our diet, we can't make. And so um, you get uh, malnutrition, you get uh, deficiencies if you just uh, eat corn. You know, you're gonna get some of the amino acids, but not all of them. So that's kind of cool. I talked about how we often mix beans and rice and corn and other things to, uh, to uh, get a complete diet. Yeah, I talk about vegetarianism. Uh, so take a look and understand what it means to be a vegan or a vegetarian. I think you guys know that. And nitrogen balance, indeed, uh, proteins. Um, if you're, you're building muscle, you take protein powder, so it can be a negative or a positive uh, nitrogen balance. And then <clears throat> what a calorie is. And uh, calorie you see on a Snickers bar is a big C. And uh, small calorie, C, small C, is one gram of water raised at one degree Celsius, how much energy. And so we can use this bomb calorimeter to, to figure out how much calories are in any kind of food, chips or anything you want to know. <clears throat> and basal metabolic rate is what we, um, is what we, is our basic energy requirements. And it's expensive, you know, being a, a mammal, we're very expensive, we use a lot of calories. Um, but you can, of course, ramp that up depending on, on your activity level, right? The basal metabolic rate is if you're sleeping, not thinking about anything, not digestion, that's just what can you live on uh, basally. And then overall, it's just, of course, uh, a spreadsheet, like an accounting. It's calories in and calories out. And uh, if you eat more calories than you burn, you're gonna gain weight. Your body's gonna store that. You store it as glycogen first and then fat eventually. And the opposite, if you burn more calories than you take in, you're gonna lose weight. And so uh, that's how our body works. And then I talked about with, with hunger, a couple interesting hormones, uh, leptin and ghrelin. And uh, ghrelin secreted by the stomach uh, when you're hungry. And then leptin comes from fat cells. And so um, uh, that's going to uh, tell you to um, burn more energy and, uh, and, and to not be as hungry. They both, they work on neuropeptide Y in your hypothalamus. That's hypothalamus, your brain tells you if you're hungry or not, right? So these two hormones, really interesting how um, uh, one makes you hungry, one makes you not. And uh, it's like a not as easy as just uh, uh, um, replacing a hormone that makes you not hungry because your body just is too smart. All right, body mass index is height and weights. It's a, a measure of obesity, but it's, there's some issues with it, um, indeed. And then vitamins and minerals. And so what I'm <clears throat> gonna ask you for is not all the B vitamins. I, I spelled it out in my lecture, but when you look at it, you definitely need to know water soluble versus fat soluble. And then A, D, and K, the fat soluble I talked about a lot. So no vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K, vitamin E, no, it's a fat soluble, but you don't, I'm not going to ask anything about it specifically. Of course, you need water. And then minerals are, uh, are inorganic and uh, you need a lot of uh, sodium and potassium and, uh, and less so of zinc and aluminum, things like that. So we have like trace ones. Yeah. And then overall nutrients, macronutrients are your carbs and your fats. These micronutrients you need in small amounts. And basically you need things like vitamins and these minerals often in real small amounts because they're a necessary component of a particular enzyme or something. And so um, without it, you start, you have issues. And so we know what causes a balanced diet. We know it's in a complete vitamin. Um, and so, uh, uh, I mean, the numbers fluctuate people like how much carbs or fats, but uh, we know there's a, we need iron in our diet and we know without it, you get anemic, right? <clears throat> but in B12, fasting moving has cobalt in it. That was, yeah, that was really cool. Yeah, and then I talked about um, uh, quasicore, protein starvation. Um, so, so, so read up on that and uh, anorexia, bulimia. Of course, I can ask on that. I think you guys are, are in tune with that. Um, all right. 
I've come to the end here. Uh, what other words of wisdom here? <clears throat> Yeah, I think you'd be in good shape if you, uh, you know, make an outline um, or use the outline uh, available at the end of the chapters. And uh, you're prepared for multiple choice, true, false questions on this material. And uh, yeah, that's all I got. So I hope this is helpful to, to, to somebody. Um, uh, again, it's optional, but it, it, this is here for you. Uh, you guys, I... I God, I really want you to do well. I do. It's a strange semester, and I hate to see people struggling too. But um, yeah, give me an email. I can I can talk to you between now and Monday. Happy to do that. So, uh, but good luck, you guys. And um, all right, study hard. <laughs>